Bonjour, bonsoir. How are you, dear friends? We are building the most inspiring and phenomenal communities of wine lovers. As we all know, wine is the catalyst of the greatest discussion. We'll be talking wine, but of course food, and everything that touches all our nation and senses. to introduce you one of the most amazing lady coming from a very far country, one of the oldest in the world, one of the most inspirational place on the planet. Her fabulous name is Fongi Walker. She studied classical Chinese in the famous university in England, Cambridge. At that time, she ran the blind tasting committee when you don't see the label and obviously she won the victory in 2004. She became obviously a very big contributor of a famous movie, Red Obsession, which was an acclaimed award-winning movie. She started her own business in China as one of the most influential women in China. She lives in the beautiful town of Beijing and what she did is the impossible. She became the first lady master of wine from China. This is a very big deal, dear friends. Therefore, I'm very pleased to introduce a very big contributor to many judging competition around the world from Australia to South Africa, the wonderful, charming, irresistible Fongi. Woo! Fongi, bonjour, bonsoir. Bonsoir or bon matin for me. Um, it's, uh, I don't have a sparkling wine and yet it's the perfect morning drink for me. I feel well, a little I won't bit. drink it. Sad. But no, no, you must drink it. Every time you open bubbles, you have to drink it. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm going to look at you deep in the eye and say, Gambe. Gambe. Well, okay. I'll just pretend. <laughs> and this is in honor because you're a woman of the arts of our friend John Legend, because what we toasted with is the LVE Napa Valley sparkling wine oh. that we make with our friend John Legend. And you're an artist as well. And you love oh. movies and writing mm. and all that. So in your honor. Wow, wow. Oh, I so wish I could have You have a beautiful have dress, Fongi. Is it a classical Chinese fashion dress? Um, yes, actually, you have a very good eye because um, it is a vintage dress and actually my mother can't remember whether it was hers or my grandmother's, but uh, I saw it and I couldn't let it go to waste because it is such a lovely, um, really old fashioned with all the traditional embroidery and most importantly of all, it matches my hair. And that's obviously the point to picking clothing. Well, you're looking beautiful. And you know, vintage clothes is certainly the big fashion these days. And having it from your grandmother to your mother keeps that wonderful tradition. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I hope to wear it a lot more, but I'll have to keep on changing my hair color. So it's, it's a lot of work, you know. Well, Fongi, I introduced you, as you know, as one of the famous graduate of Cambridge University. Tell us a little bit about ch studying Chinese at Cambridge, classical Chinese culture. That must have been a fantastic experience. It was indeed. And I mean, after, I think to this day, like classical Chinese culture is my passion and my love. Um, I got sucked into studying Chinese at university and then got attracted into doing the very classical. To give you an idea, it's kind of like starting Italian and getting sucked into Latin. Um, and I was so into it. And I actually did a lot of work comparing uh, Latin and Greek, which were my other languages, to classical Chinese. And then mm. ended up actually at Cambridge teaching how to translate classical Chinese into English. Um, possibly the world's most useless job, maybe. A um, <laughs> lot more people want to learn about wine than want to learn about translating classical Chinese poetry. <laughs> so, well, you're way too modest. This is fascinating. And, and you know, Latin, 
uh, at my time studying in, in French school was uh, an obligation. So we had to learn at least two years and most of us four or six years of Latin. And I need to tell you as unuseful it may be, one of my great aunt, when I was going to see her at the age of seven, eight and nine was forcing me to speak Latin with her as a live language because she was a Latin teacher. Wow, that's amazing. That's so cool. Oh my goodness. I wish I could speak some Latin, even though studying it for so many years, all I know is like the usual poetry and stuff. Well, but I must too. say, it's very useful for we reading wine labels because so, so many of those words are from Latin. So talking about wine, of course, how from Cambridge classical studies and teaching, how did you get in love and passion about wine? Well, you don't need much to fall into love with wine. I've always loved drinking wine since the time I was very little. Um, but what got me into it is my then boyfriend, now husband, he was captain of the university wine tasting team. And I was like, there is no such thing as a wine tasting team. You've got to be kidding me. And I got lots of pressure to join because I really love food and tasting and wine. I finally joined and I was absolutely humiliated. I I'd doubt never... that. Oh, totally. I, you know, I really enjoyed drinking wine, but I had no idea about great. I'd never heard of like weird areas like Sancerre. I, you know, I drank, you know, nice, cheap, you know, whatever was on sale at the supermarket. Um, but I decided if you can't join them, then you must beat them. So Ooh. I decided, well, I have to learn a lot about wine. I have to participate a lot and ended up um, really enjoying blind tasting and uh, then becoming the captain and making them win. So um, was it to impress your boyfriend at the time that you wanted to beat him? Oh, no way. No, no. It was to knock out all of the other guys who, because at that point it was all male and they were all making fun of me for not knowing anything. So there's one thing that I have to do is show, you know, very Cambridge undergraduate, hate to say it, but very male yes. and had to show them, you know. I love that. it. So do you actually think, Fongi, big question, and I'm convinced, of course, of the question I'm going to ask you, that women could taste maybe better than men, which proves, obviously, your curriculum and certainly you beating all those men. Well, because of the fact that I would say 70% of my students are female here in China, I will say, of course, uh, women are wonderful tasters. Yes. But I just... I really do think it's, it's what you're born with and what your passion is and what you feel like. And, you know, everyone's born with individual taste buds, individual sensitivities, and it's just exploring what you can do for yourself yes. that's the most important. That's a great advice for all our friends listening and all the ladies specifically, because as you know, uh, of course, in the West, uh, more and more ladies are moving into the wine world, which we thrilled. But you just mentioned within your educational program in China now, because you started your own educational program, you have 70% women who are attending. Easily. And in some classes, it's above that. Well, at Dragon Phoenix, that's um, our school. At yes. Dragon Phoenix, we find out that some of our like entry-level courses will be 100% women. That's um, fantastic. Yeah, it's, we actually kind of begin to think we should do it as a dating service, you know? If you're a single guy, we'll give you a free place. Come and meet lots of girls, you know? Because That's these certainly ladies, a good incentive. they're terribly attractive. They're into yes. wine. They like to drink. You know, what, what, where's the downside of that? Well, I'm with you so much. I've been, of course, to China, you know, many, many times. And what I love, specifically about the ladies, is the fact that any tasting we could do, they ask a ton of questions. They're very curious. They really genuinely want to know. And they're very fascinated by wine. So besides your influence, how do you explain that there's such an attraction towards wine at this stage? 
Well, I think in China, there's a lot of things coming together to make wine such an attractive thing for women. I mean, first of all, is that traditionally the alcoholic drink here is baijiu, which I'm sure you've been forced to drink, which is very high alcohol yes. spirits. Um, and that is not that easy to drink if you know like many chinese women your body weight is very small it's very easy to get drunk on it and wine presents a really nice alternative to that it's also let's face it more sophisticated in the way it appears to other people um it gives you a little bit more of an advantage if you know about wine particularly in this kind of culture where they really respect learning and also many women here are really in search of a way of expressing their individuality, mm. of breaking out from traditional molds of what yes. Chinese women do. And the wine is a wonderful way because it gets history and culture and lifestyle and food and everything comes together. So I think it's a really, really attractive and um, beautiful subject for them to study. Well, this is a wonderful point that you're making and that cultural statement is so important and, um, and fascinating. I mean, I'm amazed as well about their talent of tasting wine. So oh, yeah. tell us about how do you educate someone who doesn't know anything about wine in China and has interest? And how do you integrate, if you do, food within the understanding of wine? I need no excuse to integrate food at any time of the day. I, I, my first passion really is for food. But I think for a lot of people in China is, the important thing for me is to give, to break down all this idea that wine is complicated. Of course it is complicated. We know that. But there's no point making it complicated from the start. The way I present it is like, it's, it, I say it's like a Westerner approaching Chinese food. Yes. Chinese cuisine has a history of thousands of years. The first books written on Chinese cooking, mentioning Chinese cooking methods, date from 3,000 years ago. Yes. And if yes. a foreigner comes into China, it is mind boggling because there are, you know, tens, dozens of different Chinese cooking styles. There are different ways. The names are very confusing because they all have poetic Chinese names. And when a Westerner comes, oh my God, oh, am I eating? What am I eating? And what is this? And is it spicy or is it not? And they, it's a moment of panic. And, you know, many foreigners end up coming here and they, you know, sweet and sour pork or, you know, yeah. iron plate sizzling beef because it's safe. And I said, wines like that, you can start with certain safer choices, you know, choices that you may have heard of, like Bordeaux. And then as you get into it, just like a Westerner learning about Chinese food, you start exploring, oh, there's Sichuan food. Oh, there's Cantonese food. Oh, there's Pinot Noir. Oh, and look, there's an Italian, Nebbiolo. And you can start just naturally easing into this. And I think that's important. You know, Westerners don't come to China and become Chinese food experts overnight. And I said, but you enjoy the process of eating it. You enjoy sure. the process of going to restaurants. And that's the important thing, isn't it? And do you think this is why Chinese people have such a great understanding of wine? I'm impressed about the progress rate of the Chinese people in general I taste wine with and their analytical skills. Mm -hmm. Is it because the food is so complex and diverse in taste and flavors and preparation that Chinese people are used to all those flavors that they understand wine so well? Well, I think it's interesting. I have taught wine in a Western context at Cambridge and I've taught wine in, in China. And the one thing I have noticed is how much easier it is to taste to teach tasting here. Yes. And I do think that's to do with the culture. I mean, you are French, you come from a slightly different food culture, but I can certainly say in England, people don't really talk about food all the time. And they certainly don't talk about taste. But in Chinese, in my Chinese family, oh my God, from the age of like, 
four years old, we would be discussing the flavors of the seafood. I remember being fed Kobe beef by my uncle in Tokyo. And he would be like, do you understand the texture of this? Why is it? And I think I was seven years old. Is that what inspired you to wine and food and being such an expert oh. at, at that young age? Um, I think my Chinese side of the family sort of eat out at an Olympic level. Um, <laughs> they are <laughs> serious. And what was fascinating is that, you know, I remember them taking me to very good French restaurants. We used to go for Japanese or makase. We would go for, and then we, in, in Hong Kong, my grandmother would take me to different restaurants and go, today we are eating at XXX. We are eating there because of the famous dish. Now, let me introduce you what this dish should taste like. Yes. And, you know, it was like that almost every day. So, yeah. That's fascinating. So, your childhood was really cradled with all those flavors and, and oh, yeah. diversity and taste. So, on that note, we cannot let you continue to speak without having your mouth influenced. Yes. I would say maybe we should start with Burgundy, if you allow me. Oh. And then we'll move to the Deloche Pinot Noir estate in California. So what would be wonderful, of course, Fongi, is yeah. no one in the world of China, and certainly the world at large, is as good as you to describe wine. No, no, and no, 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 no. <laughs> no, this is very true. So why don't you, from a Chinese perspective, you give us a quick description of this lovely Chambol Musigny, that is the village I was born in front of. I was born in Vougeot, oh. at the famous Clos Vougeot feet in the vineyards. And as you look up, you discover the beautiful oh. village of Chambol Musigny on really the coat or the rock of the side of the Côte de Nuit. So, this is my mother's favorite wine. So I wanted oh. today to choose a wine that would be extremely elegant, like you, very refined, like you, and extremely sophisticated as you've lived a very sophisticated life. So tell us what you, what you think. Gosh, I'm making me, I, I, I don't know. I think I'm more of a sort of, I don't know rustic bulk wine myself. I doubt that. <laughs> Never worry about that. My gosh, isn't it elegant though? You say the words elegant. This wine is so elegant, isn't it? Now, there is a fruit in China that whenever I smell this kind of burgundy, I just automatically think of. And it was, it was in season about a month ago. It's called Yang Mei. Yeah, Yang and, Mei. And I think the English translation is waxberry or bayberry I'm not quite sure but it is lovely because it's a, a fruit about this big it's red it's very tart and very red fruit and when I smell this I'm just like oh oh it's got like yang mei yes. juice and spices it's such Ooh, a like useful that. fruit for um pinot noir actually yang mei mm. I love the fact that you use a local well-known Chinese food as an image. And I always say that to people who are tasting wine, feel the aromatic expression that you've, you have around you and just associate them to your glass of wine. Don't think about complex terminology or technical terms. Just go with what you know around you. Yeah, exactly. Well, I have to say, I know it's 10 in the morning, um, and I know it's pretty early, but the spittoon is definitely not being used right now. Thank you. I am just going to go freestyle on this one. <laughs> she, she, you got to go freestyle. So, but, yeah. Yeah, please. I'm sorry. You were continuing. No, no. It's, um, I just want to say how wonderful this is for a morning wine. I mean, that's what's fascinating about wonderful burgundy is that because it's got this combination of sort of lightness and yet there is power there but there's still a delicacy and an elegance which means basically you don't need much of an excuse to drink it all day long do you i mean weirdly enough 
you know, getting towards midday, I can imagine going to dim sum and having some, you know, xiao mai, some siu mai, and having this with it. It's beautiful because there's a sweetness there. There's also gorgeous acidity, sort of, oh, I feel like I need to eat something now because my mouth is salivating. <laughs> well, you're tempting us. You know, dim sum is one of my very favorite. Now, oh, really? I would like us to cover a topic that many of our friends listening today are interested in and asking questions about. You are the first lady in China to have graduated from the famous Master of Wine degree, which is the ultimate, only 350 graduates around the world. And it's really a great honor. And you've studied obviously many years to attain this level. Why did you start to study it? And what advice do you have for many of our friends listening today who wants to do it? Oh my goodness. Um, don't get sucked into it. No, it will take over your life and it will. Um, no, I, I should not do that. As a representative of the Institute of Masses of Wines, I firmly encourage you to embark on this challenging yet interesting course of study. Um, no, to be honest, um, I was very lucky at Cambridge in that quite a few of the people who came to the Blind Tasting Society were Masters of Wine. So I'd yes. heard of Masters of Wines and I had um, actually a friend who was a Master of Wine and he was very direct with me. There was one yes. year and he just said to me, come on, Fongyi, get on with it. You can be a Master of Wine. Just get on with it. And I was like, sure. I'd never taken a wine qualification. I'd never heard of WSET. Um, so I was like, okay. And I started doing a little bit of the study, study, studying WSET. And then of course, with the, e with the words of my friend ringing in my ears, go on, just do it. I kind of signed up with no idea what I was getting myself in for. Um, really? No yeah, idea if, at all. If, I knew then what I knew now, you know, as the song goes, I might not have done it. Um, especially as at the point I signed up for, picture it, I'd only moved, been in China for, I think, one year. Yes. I was trying to bootstrap my own company um, with zero financing. Um, oh, there was amazing. not really a market for wine education. We, we spent eight weeks trying to find four students for our first class. Um, and so I was trying to run that. I was also part-time teaching at Tsinghua University. Wow. Um, Talking about multitasking, this is very yes. impressive. So you, well, you, you could say that obviously one can succeed in many fields. You've succeeded to pass the exam. You've succeeded to start your wonderful company and you continue to teach. So on all the different facets, you've succeeded. So how do you attribute that success to? Oh, I have no idea. I think just um, stupidity on my part for embarking on so many things <laughs> that perhaps I shouldn't have done. Um, I, I have a habit of just not thinking and just going for it. And yes. if you meet with failure, Failure is great. Failure yes. actually teaches you more about yourself than success. Success doesn't teach you anything. Failure actually makes you go, what did I do wrong? Pick myself up, go again. And what have I learned from this? And that's why I think it's, it's really important. And okay, yeah, you can have success, but actually it's the challenge that makes life worth it. It's the challenge to you. It's making you, you know, go forward and try and deal with everything that's, you know, thrown your way. I mean, let's take COVID-19 for an instance. A lot of people are like, oh, this is terrible. And yes, it is terrible. And it's awful, you know, the deaths and everything. On the other hand, if you look at business, to me, it's, it is a terrible opportunity that also gives us a challenge. And the For way sure. we deal with it and the way we rise to it and the way we try and overcome it actually teaches us so much about ourselves and what we can do and how we can go forward under any condition. 
so well said and you're so inspirational. So what did you learn the most about yourself during this experience? I learned the most, well, I actually knew this already, that I am spectacularly unorganized. <laughs> um, I tend to fly by the seat of my pants just doing stuff. Um, I did find out for myself that if I really did want to pass the exam, I did have to sit down and do some work, which, oh, I don't like that. Um, but yeah, I had to do some work. And what I did discover is that the world of wine is so much more complex and interesting that you can dream of. And the more that you study about it, the more you realize you don't know. And the more yeah. you realize that there are mountains you can climb in front of you. And I always joke with my students, I say, I've learned far more about wine since I passed the master of wine exam. Oh, really? Uh, in a way, because I've realized where the depth of my ignorance lies. Mm. Well, you're way too modest, of course. So now, oh, you know, you're part of many judging program and competition. And you obviously taste wine from all around the world. We'd love to get your opinion about the evolution of wines in China, wow. meaning Chinese wines. And, and what is your view of, of the taste profile and how great the wines have become? Because I personally have been extremely impressed over the last 10 years, and, and I'm sure will continue to be. Well, first of all, I would like to say, um, I was at university in China back in the 90s, um, and I was drinking Chinese wine then because you couldn't drink anything else. Um, so I remember many great evenings spent at the local bar around Peking University with a bottle of Great Wall white wine. Yep. Um, we, we had one bottle of cassis we used to mix with it. Yeah. Um, the kir royal, of course. Of yes, a, a Chinese kir, can we say yes. that? <laughs> um, but I can say that since that time, Chinese wine really has been on a steady path of improvement. Um, one thing I have noticed here is that in the last 10 years, there's been an explosion of not the big state-owned companies making wine, but the small family passionate wine companies. Yes. And I think that this has been really important for China. I think that the state run, you know, the Great Walls, they can make, they can actually make decent wine. But when you get a family making wine that is really, really keen on raising the quality and investing in the land, that's when you really get um, improvement. And also the other thing that has up the bar are people coming in from outside China. That's right. So when you, you get players like LVMH, like Lafitte coming in, it really does challenge the people there to sort of up the game. Yeah, it's very well said. I'm, I really feel we're going to have an un unbelievable growth of really fine wines. I mean, the wines are all good, but we, we're moving but, into a very high stratosphere. And I you know what is so ex exactly. Yeah. And you know what is so exciting, Fungi, is the amount of fabulous Chinese restaurants around the world that will welcome now Chinese restaurants and, more importantly, Chinese wines. I mean, as you know, obviously, you've been to France many times. We probably have a Chinese restaurant every corner of every street. <laughs> <laughs> and we love, it's not the same level, of course, as what you're enjoying, but we love our Chinese food in Europe. And it's going to be very exciting to welcome great Chinese wine. I'm, I look forward to it. Yes. And I mean, it's something that I think is a great venue for Chinese wine. So when you see, you know, these Michelin starred or even better Chinese restaurants sort of going globally, I think there's a lot of potential uh, for the wines to go all over the world with that. So, Fungi, we're here to talk as well about you personally and going deeper into who you are and as one of the leading women of wine in the world and the first Chinese master of wine lady, what inspires you as a person? Um, for me, goodness me, what inspires me as a person, I think most of all, are my students. It's oh. coming here to China and seeing people who have 
you know, literally never drunk a glass of wine, yes. going from that to, you know, being able to talk about this Chambal Mousini and really enjoy it and say, hey, Fongi, I kind of, I get this wine and it's delicious and I really understand why people enjoy it. And this is for me the most important thing. What inspires me is the way the students take the knowledge and they run with it. And it makes their lives more open, more rich, more fulfilled. And to see that in so many young Chinese people is just for me absolutely moving and inspirational. Do you believe in fate or destiny? I gotta say I don't at all, at all. So you don't I... think it was written for you to do as I, get to know you and, and look at your curriculum vitae and your incredible life in the world. I have a feeling that what you're doing today was meant to happen because you're so good at it. <laughs> no, I don't think so at all. All my life, I have had one rule. Don't say no to anything. Wow. <laughs> um, great and, advice. <laughs> and, you know, and sometimes that has been really, really tricky to get out of because there's been some mistakes, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. As long as you don't say no, as long as you embrace things with all openness and go with it, I think you can always achieve success and you can always find a path in which you can be you can explore, you know, your own abilities and everything. I mean, I love what I do. I, I don't really believe in fate. I think it's more like blind sort of wandering in the dark that suddenly yeah. I sort of hit upon this road. Well, maybe on that note, as you have a lot of young ladies, uh, yeah. students as well, what is your advice to maybe more at large than we talked about earlier to all the ladies who wants to get in the wine world or who are passionate about wine? What would be your advice to them who wants to follow the same path as you or at least follow behind you. Oh goodness. Well, I said, first of all, don't follow my path. My path is ridiculous. Go for your own path, create your own destiny, go for what you want to express in yourself. You'll never be truly happy unless you're happy with yourself. And this is the whole thing, no matter where you find that happiness or that self-fulfillment, it could be in wine. It could be in art. It could be in computer programming. It could be in finding a new vaccine or researching DNA. It could be in anything. But I think the most important thing for all women is to just let yourself be yourself and don't listen to anyone else. It astounds me the degree yes. that we are culturally as women expected to listen and heed the words of what society is telling us. Well, you know, bugger that for a laugh. I think we should just go out and discover who we are and express who we are. And if you don't like it, well, you can go and find someone else to complain to. I love it. <laughs> This is, I'm going to replay and replay this moment <laughs> of our time together because you're saying it so well. And by the way, Pongi, this applies for ladies or men, of course. Follow yes. your path, follow your passion. Talking about passion, and I feel we need to serve, of course, the next wine as well. Ah, oh, yes. You know, can I, now can we're I going to move to Feel California. the label of a little bit. Can I just feel the label? Oh, you got to touch it. I, I Can you feel it? it? Can you tell me how it feels? Uh, I feel <laughs> it really is fantastic. Actually, it's really quite satisfying to feel it. It's quite Isn't satisfying. It? And of course, you're going to make people happy in China because it's got an enormous punt. Oh, and why do people like the punt? Oh, because of course, you know, that's all about the wine. The bigger the punt, the better the wine. Oh, that's you it. don't know how many times I've heard that. Really? But it does make it convenient for pouring. I feel like I can be a very, I'm not a sommelier at all. Um, I can't pour wine, but it, it does make it very easy to pour. I must well, say that. I would give you a 10 out of 10 on your master's degree uh, of wine because you poured it by showing the label and honoring us <laughs> as the wine enjoying it. So this is um, actually a Pinot Noir from the Russian river. So it's an organic and biodynamic wine. And wow. Fungi, I'm very happy to tell you that as a philosophy, all our wineries follow the biodynamic principles and are certified organic. Therefore, 
for you who live in China, we follow the lunar calendar that you live yes. by. The most important and the only one. Why is in the world living all under the lunar calendar or the Chinese? Uh, I personally am totally convinced that yes. Steiner got a cold of a copy of some Chinese almanac that was kicking around, For you sure. know, in Switzerland. And or he, he, I think he just got hold of a copy and just copied it down because honestly, yes. it's so funny sometimes when I'm trying to help wineries come to China and they they start going on about biodynamic rules and stuff, and I translate it in one sentence in Chinese. I say everything that he said, Chinese agricultural calendar. That's all you yeah. need to know. Uh, congratulations and. This is really what we say in all our wineries and we follow really those principles strictly. And you could see on both of those wines, of course, that follow this approach, this philosophy and, and those actions, we feel that je ne sais quoi, that the wine has more to give. Mother nature and that yin and yang and that absolute integration of, you know, mother nature, the cosmic energy and everything that leads to it. So. I'm delighted that you are obviously very much into this approach too. Well, I, was, I always use the analogy of them of picking a wedding date or a signing contract date in China. And yeah. I said, you know, the first thing you got to do is consult the, uh, the calendar, consult an expert with the calendar, make sure that that is a good day, an auspicious day for doing that. And I said, you know, biodynamic guys, when they barrel or when they find, they should be doing that as well. And yes. it's funny, the students totally understand that point of view. It's a very easy, I think it's actually easier to understand, to explain that in China than maybe it is yes. in the West, because that traditional sort of lunar calendar is still strongly ingrained, you know, here. Quite Absolutely. And, you know, we're starting to really now, which I'm really delighted to see, influence wine tasters, wine professional, wine journalists to taste on the right few days of the month in the ultimate time for wine to be prepared and ready, whether it's a food day, according to what you love or root day. And that's the exciting part. So I'm so glad you're having this dialogue with your, with your students. And do they see a difference? For the tasting or for the calendar? <laughs> both. <laughs> well, it's Probably interesting both. because I think biodynamics calendars work on a slightly different principle. And to be honest, the biodynamic calendar is in no way as complicated as a Chinese calendar. Because when, if you have an app for it, I have an app on my phone. Yes. Um, and you open it and it says, this day traveling to the West is bad. This day uh, oh, really? signing agreement. Oh, it, I'm, I'm not kidding. You are listed out, you know, a list of things that are good, a list of things that are bad, a list of things that are neutral. You get what direction to face is better, you know, everything. Everything. So, so we got to get that app. What is the name of that app? We should oh all know. I can't remember. Maybe it's, it's in it's, Chinese, so it's going to be I, really yeah. difficult. It's in Chinese, and I downloaded it to make my mother happy. Oh, I love it. So the one <laughs> we use a lot here is Moon and Garden. It's a great okay. app that is quite simple and gives you, if it's a food day, a leaf day, a root day, etc. And advise you mainly about gardening. So it has nothing to do really with anything more professional, but give us a few words on this wine because then yeah. I have a big question for you, Bonji. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, for one thing, one thing you do notice I had, I just actually reasonably recently bought a group of students to actually Russian River Valley. And the one thing that they were impressed is how drinkable the Pinots mm -hmm. are. I think for yes. some people, particularly if you've started with Bordeaux or sort of stronger wines, a lot of them drink sort of Cabernets a lot and you go straight to Burgundy, you're sort of like, oh my goodness, this is kind of yes. acid and it's kind of, you know, a bit austere and I don't know whether I like it. And you get the Russian River 
more generosity of fruit, that warmer profile, that sort of richer mouthfeel. And they go, oh yeah, I'm, I'm so much more comfortable with this. Yes, well, I'm, I'm delighted to hear because they both, as you just said, really complement one another. They're very different. And on a table as we have it, you have Chambon Musini and now the estate of the Loach from the Russian River, two different wines, two different styles. And have you ever had this with um, Chongqing hot pot, like spicy yeah, hot pot? I believe I have, actually. Delicious. Well, I love that dish, of course. Now, talking about that dish, how would you differentiate a deep question that I've always wondered and no one really explained me well, the difference of a Chinese palate versus a Western palate? Is there for you who spend time in all the cultures, would you define it or can we define it as such? I don't think you can define it. I think um, in China, uh, first of all, what we do have is a, many people who have a palate that is a beginner to wine. Yes. In other words, it's a strange flavor. Yes. So. I think that those people are no more different or similar than to people in the West. We're all human. We all have exactly the same setup of the taste buds. Chinese, I would say, because of the food culture, is more sensitive to a greater array of flavors. Yes, For instance, I would say so. My students always laugh at me because I said, why are you studying Western wine tasting? What the hell do the Westerners know about taste? They only just discovered umami about 20 years ago. That's very true. How can you respect that? Chinese have known about umami for thousands of years and we've That's been talking about true. it. So <laughs> well, like, I'm... how can they tell us about taste? <laughs> well, I agree with that. And I'm always very impressed, Punji, about um, the level of spice or herbs or flavor that we are slowly but truly discovering in the West that you already know and you use as descriptors. And it mm -hmm. could be an entry level wine taster. And I recall recently I was in, in China in November and I remember forever those three ladies who were just loving the wines. And I said, please describe it for me. They were amazing and they employ, you know, uh, herbs and, and flavors and spices specifically, I did not even know. And it was so right on. So I agree with you. Very, very, very impressive. I think the other thing you really see in China though that really strikes me is the way that the food cultures of different parts of China influence people's palate. Yes. Because like, I really like food from the sort of Northeast and the Northwest, which is rustic and, you know, got a little bit of meat and salty and you can put a bit of spice into it, but it's not that spicy. And it's just like hearty and rich. And I noticed people from those areas really like for instance, Russian River, you know, Valley Pinot Noir. They like it rounder. They, they like the Merlots. They like the Cabernets. And then you go to Southwest China where they love spiciness and spice and numbing and all of these flavors. And those people, I think, because they eat food that's quite strongly flavored, they like stuff that's really quite strong. Um, they really like... Um, for instance, Madeira, and they like a lot of like Napa cabs and stuff like that. And then yeah. you go to the Southeast and the Eastern coast where people eat much lighter. And that's where you go to have good Riesling parties and, oh. you know, more things like Burgundy. Burgundy definitely has a much stronger presence on the East coast of China. And I think yeah. that's to do with the food. Yeah, so we, we divided Similarly in France, between the Southwest, oh, yeah. the Northeast, and the yeah. Center East, it's fascinating. Yeah. Now, a very big question, more personal. What is your passion? Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> I, uh, Besides, of course, it? being who you are, as a passionate lady in everything you do, and we could see that, is there one passion you haven't yet described that we should know about? I'm afraid I'm a very shallow person, really. Um, I don't, I don't really, it's far too much energy to get passionate about something, isn't it? It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, you're not passionate I, at all about wine and you food. Know, well, 
I, is that passionate or is that just sort of the way it is for me? <laughs> or maybe, maybe I just live in a constant flow of passion. Maybe it's just my life. I think that's your life. It's amazing. It seems as Lady Gaga would say, you're born that way. And yeah. <laughs> very fortunate. <laughs> so is there um, a dream, Fonji, that you wish to share that you've not really shared yet that you wish would eventually happen to you or to the world at large? Oh, goodness. Well, I, I must say for me personally, I, I don't have any dreams and I, I've never actually had any ambition. I just wanted to do the things I want to do and see whether they work out. But wow. for the world at large, my goodness, I have so many dreams. Uh, uh, it's, you know, the one thing that, that really, really strikes me is I just, I just hope people can understand each other. I can hope that we can stop, you know, destroying our world. I have a very, very narrow dream that one day China will wake up to single use plastics and stop using it drives me insane. <laughs> um, you know, my dreams are sort of weird dreams like that, um, which I, you know, I try not to think about as I walk past the 800 people delivering food delivery in single use plastic containers. Um, yeah, but, <laughs> but caring about the environment is essential. I think it's really important. And I think it's so important, particularly in China, where, you know, lifestyles are getting more and more developed. And we've sort of leapt, you know, I remember in the 90s, where if you wanted to take away food from the restaurant, you had you brought your own container. Yes. You know, uh, back in the 90s, China was actually really environmentally good. You know, we walked everywhere, we biked everywhere. Yes. If, you, if you brought your own food containers, there wasn't delivery service. And actually, in a way, it's sort of our lives have gotten a lot more comfortable. Mm -hmm. And then it gets me a little bit angry that the Westerners who have enjoyed a high standard of living for so long are now turning around to China and going, oh my God, look at you, you're so terrible. Well, look, you know, in England, they so polluted the waterways from the Industrial Revolution that in, even in the 80s, if you fell into the Thames, you had to go see a doctor. That's right. You know, and so let, okay, China's making mistakes now in that rapid rush. But what we need is understanding. And what we need to understand is that there's like billions of people here who are trying to raise themselves up to that's a standard right. of living that's not the West, it, it's trying to get close to the West, but for the mass, vast majority of people, we're still a long way away from it. But allow some mistakes, uh, you know, the, you know it, it really does frustrate me because I would love to see China reach a stage of development with ecological awareness and with environmental awareness. I mean, that for me would be so amazing, I'm but sure it's it going to take up. time. And I'm sure it will come because it's in your yeah. DNA and it's in your past. So it will be eventually in your future. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe as we conclude this amazing time together, any message for anyone in the world that wants to come to the world of wine that you wish to finally say? I know you had an amazing inspirational discussion on it, but maybe the last few words before we sadly have to say goodnight. Never ask me for a last few words. You should know by now. <laughs> I don't do a few well, words. We're learning so much. It's so fascinating. But what I would love to say to people is I just wish everyone the courage of their convictions to go out and do what you love, do what you're passionate about, yes. and do it well. Because if you love it, Everything that you love is worth doing well. And even if you don't love it, try to put passion and feeling and confidence and don't listen to other people. The only critic that matters in the end is yourself and your heart, isn't it? I love it. <laughs> On that fabulous note, Bungwe, thank you so, so much. She -she. And we she, should say she. that in many yeah. languages because I know you're the experts of not only <laughs> classical Chinese, but many others. We want to dearly thank you for being such an inspiration, such a success, such an amazing ambassador for ladies and the world of wine. And what you're doing in China is a miracle for China and for the rest of the world. So we send you all our love, 
all our affection and admiration. Oh, thank you so much. And now I'm going red, just like this wine. So cheers. <laughs> cheers and see you very soon in person.